Cynthia, thanks for <laughs> joining me here today. Sure. Uh, it's really great to have you. And thank you also for working on the machine behavior paper that we're all working on. It's been very great to collaborate with you. I was going around the internet uh, over the last few days and I saw a talk where um, you were talking about your personalized uh, personal robot, mm. Jibo. Mm. And this, this robot is fascinating. It has all of these very cute features to it and it is designed to interact with us humans in a way that we kind of actually can feel that it's our personalized social robot. It's social. Mm -hmm. And I'm somewhat of a pessimistic social scientist and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, huh, look at this robot. It's interacting in this very personable way. It's a very social way. And is this just yet, an, just yet another technology that comes along and somewhat reduces human social capital? So we had the television and now we have mm -hmm. smartphones and, and the television reduced um, the kind of participation in civic institutions and, and social capital. And now we have an increasing frequency of weak ties via our, our cell phones, but maybe less quality face-to-face -face mm -hmm. interaction with humans. And I got to worrying oh my gosh, here we are again, uh, another cliff where social capital is gonna be eroded. Mm. Are you concerned about this? If you're not concerned about this, why? And kind of what do we need to know and understand about mm. social robots to placate these concerns? Yeah, so uh, so social robots, I think is a, it's a very different technology than the ones that, that you've mentioned. Um, I think to understand you know, the answer, I wanna first, give you a little bit of context, you understand mm -hmm. the history yeah. of the field that kind of leads us to like, why I'm answering the way I am right now. <laughs> you know, so um, social robots actually uh, first originated from a field called autonomous robots. Mm -hmm. So robots that are really conceptualized to be more like artificial creatures, you know, that can perceive the world on their own and make decisions and learn and, and so forth. And back then, the kind of universally accepted value proposition of autonomous robots was to be able to do kind of the dull, dirty, and dangerous far from people. Mm -hmm. So it was about kind of robots far from people because of their autonomy, they can explore the oceans, they can go into volcanoes, and they can even now explore Mars. Yeah. And I actually uh, was a graduate student uh, at the time in uh, Professor Rod Brooks here in what was then called the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. Mm. And you know we were designing all these kind of insect-like robots, and it was all about kind of uh, building robots that can navigate rough terrain, and uh, I remember it was literally, you know, the day that NASA landed Sojourner and Pathfinder on Mars. And that was like a huge accomplishment for Big like day. NASA, yeah. but also just the whole field of robotics just celebrated in that moment. And I remember thinking that, um, okay, so here we are, we can send these robots into all these amazing places and now even on Mars, but they're not in our homes yet. They're not in human society. And it's like, I grew up like a Star Wars kid, right? <laughs> it's like so many of us in AI and robotics, you know, we, went into this field because we were inspired by kids. And so, you know, with my first kind of in-depth exposure to the idea of what an autonomous robot was, was like R2-D2 and C-3PO. <laughs> Which is great. You know, it's like, it was all about um, not just the cool intelligence and capability, it was absolutely around the relationships and, and not only between the robots, between the robots and the human counterparts. Mm -hmm. And in so many ways, I think the world fell in love with those robots because they were full-fledged characters, right? So here I am at 10, and like that's, that's just the image of robots that I'm growing up with, right? Yeah. Which is probably pretty different from, you know, my, Rod Brooks talks about 2001 was kind of like his inspirational movie, right? So anyway, so at the time, um, robots were, I'd say it's kind of an analogous time to, you know, in the time when computers were very expensive, specialized pieces of equipment that only experts used. And then there was a shift of thinking about what would it mean to bring a robot into, I mean, a computer onto every desk, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it was kind of that moment for me, thinking about what would it really take to start bringing these robots into the human environment, and thinking about that more deeply. And you know, again, kind of the the obvious point, but back then not so obvious in that you know, designing a machine that can interact with the inanimate world mm -hmm. and navigating. Mm -hmm is fundamentally different than designing machine that can interact with engage the social world. So at the most basic level, interacting with things that are governed by the laws of physics versus interacting with beings whose behavior is governed by having a mind, right? Yeah. 
totally different. So for the first time thinking about what would it mean to build a robot or a machine that has social and emotional intelligence, yeah. because that's what we need in order to be able to do this, right? So very, very different framing of the nature of AI. We already knew from you know, building even these very insect-like robots to navigate rough terrain that people anthropomorphize them. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of psychology that says that when, you, you know, when an entity elicits enough of these cues, our, our social thinking structures of our brain get engaged, right? We almost can't turn them off. It's kind of like that's just what's getting uh, uh, brought to bear in order to try to understand what kind of entity is this? How can I predict its behavior? You know, how can I potentially even collaborate with it, right? Mm -hmm. So again, that's just kind of giving you the context of, of where the work originated and kind of how this framing of this new kind of intelligence and this new kind of robot came to be. A lot of the early work was really trying to understand what would be this universal interface. You know, mm -hmm. the thought was the social interface would be the universal interface. And you know, the first social robot I built, which is recognized today as kind of being the, the first social robot, is Kismet. Yes, it's very cool. And that was all inspired by developmental psychology and the social development of us, right? So how do we, through interacting in this social environment with you know, more social capable others who care for us, how do we develop this amazing social and emotional intelligence that you know, is a hallmark of our species? And yeah. so this biologically inspired deep appreciation of how it starts within us and what are those interactions and what are the dynamics and the mutual regulation of that and the critical role that emotion plays in that early form of communication at the most fundamental level. Mm -hmm. It's kind of always been there, kind right. of under the surface, right? So the early work was, you know, a lot about, I would say, kind of this, this different kind of intelligence, social emotional intelligence to build now technologies that aren't just really sophisticated tools that people use, but can actually engage as collaborative partners. Mm -hmm. so to be able to collaborate, you need to be able to have a theory of other minds, you need to be able to infer intense desires, you know, these kind of goals, these, you know, from, from behavior. So new questions, I would say, in a lot of ways for, for AI. Yeah, very much. As so. the field started to develop, the question also came upon, you know, what are the interesting applications? What, what is the value add of something like a social robot where you could certainly build a robot with social competence that's a manufacturing robot, mm -hmm. you know, or a car or something. But what if the form of kind of engagement and help is interpersonal in nature? So then we started looking at applications where social and emotional support was really valuable. Mm -hmm. And in many, many cases, these are areas where this personalized, uh, Engagement with an empathetic other, we know for human beings, leads to the most positive, impactful outcomes for the person. Yep. So again, with that kind of appreciation of for us as human beings to unlock our human potential, to get us to engage in a way that allows us to learn better or make better decisions or change our behaviors in the way we want to change them, to essentially become the people who we aspire to be we need the social and emotional support. Right. So if we were going to now create technologies that can help us do these things, which are also profoundly important, um, they need to have this ability to engage us on these levels. So for my work, at least, it's always been around how do you unlock human potential? How do you support people in our ways of thinking, experiencing, knowing, you know, that allows us to move ourselves forward? Mm -hmm. um, and so then when we talk about things like loneliness and et cetera, et cetera, for me, it's never about the machine replacing people or taking away from human autonomy, but it's more of asking the question, what is this kind of, this, the, the special affordances of the social emotional aspect of this technology, what is its role? How does it need to engage a person to empower that person to kind of become who they want to be, mm -hmm. right? Not doing it for them, but supporting them so that they can do it for themselves. And that's a very different kind of framing than the, we're gonna build the kind of robot friends that are gonna mean that you don't have to have real friends. It's not about <laughs> that. It's about appreciating humans need, people need people. I, I, you know, I, again, reading a lot of the social psychology, I just, I fundamentally believe that we as human beings need to feel valued and respected and, and a sense of belonging to other human beings. Yeah. Even if we have the world's most awesome dog, you know, and, and other kinds of relationships in our lives, and ultimately maybe the world's most awesome supportive robot, 
we're still going to need our human relationships to really flourish, right? And so for me, the question is around loneliness. It's like certainly there can be some engagement that can alleviate you know, the sense of like, I may be living alone, but I don't feel alone. But more importantly, the question is, how do these technologies help to foster and support the human connection? Mm -hmm. Because that's really important. Mm -hmm. So you know, we talk about things like empathy and, and so forth. I feel, to getting back to your point about social media and the television, one of the things that we've been finding that I think is quite different about this socially embodied, socially, physically co-present technology is it does elicit and support the face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. And sure. so, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, our brains are these wonderful, amazing plastic things, but if we don't practice and engage and exercise those skills, mm -hmm. they can atrophy. And so if we are in a world where our technologies remove all of this interpersonal engagement, cue reading, empathy, that those skills get weaker. You know? So my aspiration for this technology is it's a humanistic, humanized technology in that it engages us in a way that we can engage in the human experience more deeply, continue to practice, engage in those skills so that it becomes just, again, easier for us to treat and engage with each other in the ways we want to be treated and the way we want to treat each other. So that's yeah, the yeah. aspirational view. Okay. I recognize with any technology, you can also do it in a very uh, non-beneficial way. Sure. But, but my, my hopes and aspirations are to develop these technologies, understand human behavior in the context of these machines, and push this more humanistic vision forward as kind of the, the gold standards of supporting human values that, that we all, I think, ultimately want, yeah, right? Yeah. Very fascinating stuff. So what you said something in there that is, I, I think, uh, the crux of a really interesting social, scientific, and machine behavior question, mm -hmm. which is that you need to, in some ways, gain the trust of humans. These personal robots mm -hmm. need to gain the trust of humans. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's through the you know, expression of and creation of empathy. Mm -hmm. But what happens is now you have humans trusting robots, mm -hmm. which is a fascinating thing. I actually have a uh, little, you know, robotic vacuum, a, a Neato, and uh, he cleans my uh, floor and uh, makes annoying beeping sounds when he's full, <laughs> and I uh, give him weird uh, human-like uh, characteristics. Apparently, I've, I've gendered him, um, <laughs> and the the thing that's Interesting to me, and it's always surprising to me, is the degree to which I note myself feeling m more emotions than just annoyance at his mm. beeping. I'm like, oh, I need to make sure that Nito is clean so that he can run properly mm. and so that he lasts longer and things like that. Mm. Very strange things uh, you know, for a social scientist to be doing <laughs> to this largely inanimate robot that's dumb and bumps around into <laughs> things all day. And I can imagine that if a robot that I owned possessed more humanistic traits, that I would indeed start to feel stronger ties to it, stronger mm -hmm. emotional ties to it. And ultimately, if that robot was aimed at, say, let's, let's say improving my, uh, you've talked about this before, improving mm -hmm. my physical activity and therefore mm -hmm. kind of my, my uh, overall body health by getting me to burn more calories. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's involved in that is that I need to be able to, as a human, defray the short-term benefits mm -hmm. of eating a bunch of food right now mm -hmm. and uh, actually expose myself to the short-term costs, which mm -hmm. are maybe the unpleasantness of working out mm -hmm. or something like that. And if it's the robot that's able to get me to do that, because I trust the robot, mm -hmm. because I built a relationship with the robot, mm -hmm. it now has the capacity to say, hey, don't eat that thing. Trust me on this. You'll, you'll thank me in three months. Um, <laughs> And I guess the question that I have there is, how do we as machine behaviorists understand the balance between the machine behaviors required mm -hmm. to get me as a human mm -hmm. to trust this machine? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so how much, how do we balance my trust of that machine with the potential risk mm -hmm. for that machine to take advantage of that trust. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a negative framing because, again, there's, as you just said, there's very positive ways of doing mm -hmm. this. That trust can produce many positive things. Um, but we've seen that sometimes bots, when they're brought into society, don't necessarily always mm -hmm. produce positive things. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure the trust doesn't get violated? 
Yeah, well, so I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of um, ways, I think, to, it's probably a, a multifaceted uh, approach to be able to try to ensure as much as possible that it doesn't happen. I, I don't know if you could ever guarantee it not to happen just because we certainly also live in a world where people will do things with these technologies that are intended not to help, right? Sure, so sure. just kind of putting the nefarious, you know, kind of <laughs> human element aside and just thinking about, you know, what if it is people with the best intentions trying to create technologies that, that help people? I think as we design any technology, I think as part of a, again, kind of this humanistic design stance is we don't want the technology to become a crutch for people, mm -hmm. right? And so, and you want to respect human autonomy and decision making and human dignity. So for me personally, I would not want to design a robot that would tell you, don't eat that, trust me. I, I would want to design a robot that would help you to reflect mm. upon the decision you're going to make with the hope that over time, with practice, with even forming habits, you will be able to decide, okay, I really want that piece of cake, but I'm used to not, you know, I'm used to having the self-control not to have it, so I cannot have it today, right? So to empower the person to give them the, the skills that they need, mm -hmm. right? So even as a parent, right, for your child, how much do you continue to do things for them, tie their shoes, right. versus when do you kind of like let them contend with the challenge and the struggle, right? But how do you do it in a supportive way? Yeah. You're not doing it for them. You're, you're, you're supporting them in their challenge, but ultimately it's because you want them to have the competence themselves in a genuine, authentic way, right? So I think that's just a design philosophy. I think that's important for technologies in general because, again, I don't think we want technologies to ever be a crutch or have people be over-reliant on them. Yeah, that's a great I point. think in terms of this trust question, there are so many aspects of trust, right? So there is privacy, security, reliability kind of trust, which is often when we talk about the technological standpoint. But the thing about these personified technologies is they can also cross over into this interpersonal trust, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, we've certainly done research showing that you know, we as human beings have evolved all these mechanisms for being able to ascertain you know, these social judgments of, is, are you someone I trust? Are you a friend or foe? Do, are we alike? Do I like you? Know, all these kinds of things. And yeah, a lot of this involves not only what you say, but your nonverbals and just a whole host of cues. So robots can certainly be designed, and we actually did you know, a fascinating study showing that once you could have, once you understood some of those key cues, you could actually design an AI that from observing kind of how two people interact, you could actually have more accurate predictions of whether the other person would be more trustworthy in an economic game mm -hmm. than what people would do, right? So it's kind of once you understand the mechanism at work, you can start to you know, apply machine learning to really kind of optimize for that, right? So these nonverbal cues are certainly really important. Um, I think in terms of you know, the bigger questions of trust, I think understanding these technologies is actually really important. I feel like so much of our conversation in society is kind of like the magic wand. You know, like I, I make a joke like a uh, bicentennial man, right? It's like you have this world where there are no humanoid robots and one day you wake up and there's this full-fledged, completely autonomous humanoid robot on your doorstep. It's never going to happen, right? Never, never going to happen, mm -hmm. right? But there's this kind of like poof, suddenly it's fully intelligent, sentient, whatever you, you call it, right? Yeah. I feel like, you know, children growing up today are growing up in such a different time and not just because of kind of social media and all those things, but you know, they're growing up, I, I, I say they're not only digital natives, they're AI natives, right? They're now growing up in a time where they've always been able to interact with intelligent machines. Yeah. And it's really important they grow up understanding how machines think and growing up with the attitude that they can design them or empower to do so and to be able to do that as early as possible. Because I feel like the more visceral understanding you have of the way they think and the way they work, that's also gonna help you frame What's an appropriate relationship? Mm. What's the appropriate trust? And I think when we talk about designing for trust, we want to make sure we design systems to help you build in a sense of appropriate trust, but we also want people to be savvy enough to also understand what's an appropriate trust. Because you don't want people to overtrust or undertrust anything, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to technology. So, you know, a, a growing part of my research now is thinking about, you know, K-12 AI education because I think it is really important, not only for kids, but for families who are now living with these intelligent devices, mm -hmm. to have more of a sense of appreciation of what's happening under the hood, 
Mm -hmm. as well as just democratizing these technologies so that people can apply them to you know, meaningful challenges and problems that they as their community face. And it's not just the few who can create these technologies, but really to democratize that. So it's very interesting to think that these machine behaviors may need to come with basically concomitant human education. <laughs> that we, we, need to be, we need to be trained on the appropriate ways to interact with and think about these agents. You said something very interesting uh, earlier on a couple of minutes back. You said something very interesting about the way that we want to make sure that the behaviors of robots mm -hmm. don't engender dependence mm -hmm. and that they are enablers as opposed to creators of, of dependence. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of thoughts on that mm -hmm. and a couple of questions. One, one thought is, okay, well, how do you do that in the context of the kind of capitalist profit motive, right? We, we, we want bots, we want, I want, I, if I'm a, if I'm a, you know, arch capitalist, I want people to be reliant on my bots so they have to mm -hmm. keep coming back to them. That's maybe a little bit of a side, but then more of a scientific question is, mm -hmm. how do you ensure that the behavior of bots is designed to, or actually mm -hmm. does not create dependence in humans mm -hmm. and does enable them? And, and my, mm -hmm. my wife is a clinical psychologist mm -hmm. and she knows a lot about cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. CBT. Mm -hmm. And one of the core paradigms of that approach is basically getting the uh, patient, getting the, the um, person you're working with to do the things on their own, to realize mm -hmm. things on their own. How do you make sure that if, if in the future we have bots for personal therapy, say, mm -hmm. say in fact, we can automate uh, mm -hmm. doing of CBT with social robots, how do you make sure that those social robots actually do create that autonomy? Mm -hmm. How do we measure that? How, how, how mm -hmm. do we think about that? Well, I mean, I think, I think there's multiple aspects of that. I think one it just gets to, also to this question of what is the, what is the role? What is the role of, of these kinds of technologies in society writ large, right? So in a lot of my work, you know, we've been looking at social robots in the context of early childhood learning and looking at aging in place and health at home. And across so many of these areas, we hear a very similar story, which is we as the institution may be able to provide world-class, high-quality care and intervention, mm -hmm. but we can't extend that to the home. And we need to be able to reach and have those things reinforced in home as well. So when I think about these technologies, I see them as teammates to the extended stakeholder team, mm -hmm. which could certainly is the main person who's trying to derive the benefit, but also the other stakeholders who are contributing and supporting that person's success, right? So I see these technologies as part of that extended team, right? So when you talk about you know, in, in, um, any sort of therapeutic intervention, I would envision the robot could be essentially the reinforcer practice partner at home, mm -hmm. but you're still mm -hmm. working with your clinician, your therapist, your teacher, you know, your, your, your human professional, and the robot is able to help support uh, the full team in terms of helping the professional track the progress, understand, you know, so is the dependence happening or not? I mean, that could be something that only the machine is designed to try to have behavioral measures, probes to understand, but also you would have a human professional in the loop to also, in perhaps different methods, measure and try to assess that. Is the dependency happening? Is the, dependence, is the independence being fostered and so forth? Mm -hmm. So I see them as part of, again, a team. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with fine-grained, potentially more fine-grained interaction within the home, you know, there are a range of measures. There's gonna be behavioral measures. There's going to be potentially ways that you can ask, you know, between the clinician maybe interviewing with the family members, like, what are you seeing, right? So I think there could be multiple viewpoints in trying to get that holistic picture of let's making sure that this person is, is growing and flourishing in the way we all want to have happen. It shouldn't all be on kind of the technology's shoulders to do that. I think we need to really support the whole community that's involved in, again, in the well-being and flourishing of, of, of the individual in, in question. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Yeah. That's, a great, that's a great point. I, I mean, I, I guess as a social scientist that uh, kind of further employs me in the sense that <laughs> you need social scientists and, and experts Absolutely. and psychologists to come work with them and, and evaluate them. Yeah. Um, you also said something a, a while back. We talked about empathy. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe getting into a little bit of the philosophical weeds, mm. but 
and the and this and the sort of uh, affective science, mm-hmm. like psychological science, means we kind of know empathy when we see it, mm-hmm. uh, and we see it in other people, mm-hmm. and we can kind of say, ah, yes, that person seems to have more empathy. That person seems mm-hmm. to have less empathy. Mm-hmm. How do we measure empathy in robots? Mm. And, and what do we, it, it doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, do we just rely on third person, like third party perceptions of? It? Do we just ask people, does this robot mm-hmm. seem like it has empathy? Mm-hmm. How do you think about that when you develop these robots? You know, I mean, again, it kind of, for me, depends on how is how, you're designing a robot, what are the objectives of, of the system you're trying to create, right? So, what is the nature of the question you're trying to, to answer, yeah. or what is the role? so to speak, of the system that you're trying to design, right? So you could be asking a scientific question of what is empathy, and you have psychological models of that that you actually want to you know, put into computational models and put that into a robot and put that robot in interaction with other people and see how well does that model actually stand up in real-time interaction with the person. And so it's really about kind of how, how good is my theory? Mm. How good is my computational model? That's like one kind of aspect. Mm-hmm. If you're looking at empathetic behavior within an AI, is the ultimate objective to help support an individual to be able to change their behavior or to learn something new? And the empathetic supportive interaction is really designed for this other outcome, which is not for the machine to be empathetic in some sort of deep philosophical sense, but it's to engage the person in interactions that allows them to to you know, achieve the outcomes that you hope they will, right? So mm. the question is kind of like, is is it to build empathy? Is it to help help people build more interpersonal empathy with each other, right? So is the focus on the human being? Is the focus on the AI and the computational challenge of the machine? Is is the focus on a deeper scientific understanding potentially by building computational models of these things, embedding them in machines, and using that machine almost as a kind of in situ simulator, real world socially interactive system to be able to assess whether your model is actually capturing all the qualities and you can mm-hmm. map it onto human behavior, right? So it's like, it kind of depends like what, what's the question, what's the objective, right? Because you can approach it from all of those different angles. I think, you know, if you're looking at the intervention of the person, you'd be looking at the behavior. So almost like regardless of how, um, how authentically it's trying to model what we think is going inside our brains when we do empathy, like mm-hmm. almost independent of that, is the machine generating behaviors and context that gives you enough of this behavioral hook that you feel that this is an empathetic interaction mm. and that that, because you feel, again, emotions can be in here, but emotion can also be shared across us, right? Is, is it creating this level of emotional engagement that you can then take on and you can then succeed because of that, right? That's 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 one layer. The other one be more the pure AI understanding right, right. kind of the inner workings within our ourselves. But even so, it's like emotions and these social interactions. I mean, we've evolved to have our kind of emotions because it is about this interpersonal, right? And yeah. so I, you know, for human emotions, I have a hard time saying how you could quantify it purely as a solitary activity, especially something like empathy, which is really about this, this mutually regulated kind of interaction, right? So, so you can look at it from all those different angles and goals and objectives. And I think, depending on that, you may frame what you're measuring in a different way. Um, I don't know how you measure authentic, whatever that even means, authentic emotional experience <laughs> within yeah. the machine, just because the same way that I'm not sure how you would measure that in a person. We have all these biophysical things. I mean, there's exactly. all kinds of things going on. Yeah. There's the quality experiential. I guess at the deepest level, though, if, if, if my goal is to help empower people to succeed, to me, that's almost, it's fascinating, but it's almost secondary to creating a machine that gets in the right dynamics of interaction with a person to tap into the human potential to allow that person to achieve what they want to achieve, right? So again, it's just yeah. a different framing of what I'm, the behaviors and the metrics I'm using and as I'm designing these systems to be about the human robot experience and ultimately how that empowers the individual I see. So the than what's ma- going on deep inside there. Machine empathy is empathy if it produces 
outcomes that would be produced by empathy in, in other settings. Or in other empathy, words, you, a successful, you know, uh, empathy behavior is measured by the elicitation of empathy in the person that empowers them to kind of achieve the bigger goal that you want them to achieve, right? So it's a human, yeah. it's a human facing, ultimately it's a human facing construct that I would be looking at behaviorally, the way they self-report, behavior over time, right? Yeah. That's how I would be interested okay. in looking at it. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very interesting. So there's a really interesting kind of dynamic here, which is the opportunity to design uh, robots for I interventions in educational mm -hmm. settings and then get feedback um, from the intervention of those personal robots in educational settings to then kind of tweak the design. Mm -hmm. How do you... How do you do that? Uh, you've done it a lot for a variety of different mm -hmm. robots. What does it look like to go about trying to design, test, evaluate, redesign, mm -hmm. test, evaluate? How do, how do you do that? Yeah, so, um, you know, when we approach this work, there's kind of two kind of major buckets of intellectual contributions we hope to be able to make. One will be around the AI algorithmic kind of technical evaluations, and those will look at kind of, you know, methods and techniques of evaluating convergence of machine learning algorithms and, you know, accuracy of predictions and all that kind of more traditional computational sense. And then there's this human behavioral impact and kind of the machine human interaction side. And there we're applying many techniques from psychology and kind of the same interventions that people would use if it was like a person interacting with another person, but we replaced one of the people, so to speak, with kind of a robot, and we're looking at, you know, the kinds of measures and interventions that a practitioner may be applying, right? So um, we do a lot of randomized controlled trials, mm. um, and we do them for one-shot interactions as well as interactions that may be going on for months, right? So longitudinal, long-term kind of interactions. Um, we do pre-post, you know, when you want to look at outcomes, you know, we want to get a baseline, we want to be able to see, like, from this intervention, what are the knobs we might want to be exploring, right? What if the robot is more expressive versus more neutral in its effect? How does it impact children's learning outcomes, right? So we can do a kind of systematic um, analysis at a very fine grain level of detail of kind of human behavioral mechanisms to be able to see what the impact is on human behavior on, on kind of at, at the other end of it. So for instance, we'll often start by like, if we're gonna, we do a lot of work with early childhood learning. We're looking a lot at both engagement outcomes as well as learning outcomes. Development of oral language, kind of sophistication in terms of you know, syntactic complexity, vocabulary acquisition, mm -hmm. all those kind of mm -hmm. traditional kind of readiness metrics that you would look at as far as what schools would care about to assess kindergarten readiness. Um, so we go to the literature, and we're like, okay, so we're gonna design a social robot that's going to engage children more as a peer-like companion, and through this process of storytelling and dialogic question asking storytelling and embedding key vocabularies in the stories, we wanna get a sense of how does that affect, you know, and personalization of that, you know, the personalization algorithms, how does it affect the learning outcomes of these different groups? But then how should that robot interact, right? So we can look at these social behaviors versus those social behaviors. Now, of course, we need to talk about like peer-to-peer -peer learning in children. You can't control the minutia of those behaviors, right? You get the whole child. Yeah. You got the whole child interacting with the whole child, right? The thing that's really cool about these robots is you can actually have very focused design permutations to say, we're gonna run a condition where we're gonna look at this level of expressivity or these kind of social cues or this kind of behavior. And we're gonna be running it across all the conditions and we're gonna be able to systematic look and see how does it impact engagement, how does it impact learning outcomes, right? And we end up publishing a number of papers in psychology journals because in some sense that robot is also not only an intervention for education, but is also a scientific instrument mm -hmm. to say what is the role of expressivity in engagement in children's learning? You can't study that any other way, right? right. You just can't study it. Yeah. So anyway, so there's a fascinating interplay between kind of the science, psych psychological science, mm -hmm. as well as the inter educational interventions, as well as the AI design, that we, we, we work at that intersection. You know, and we'll do interviews and questionnaires. I mean, we'll, do, we'll, we'll, we'll apply all the methods that, you know, educators, you know, psychologists use to assess human impact. We'll apply all of those, you know, video, you know, annotation, analysis, right? all of that because you're trying to get a kind of, again, a 360 viewpoint 
of what is what is the phenomenon here we have at play, right? So when you're when you're developing, I've, I've done a lot of experiments myself, and one of the tricky bits in doing experiments is always figuring out exactly which treatment arms to run, which conditions mm -hmm. to run, because you only have so much money and you only you're have so many right. subjects, right? That's absolutely right. So when you have a social robot mm -hmm. that you can effectively parameterize across almost a full continuous space of a mm -hmm. bunch of different variables, mm -hmm. how do you narrow it down? Yeah. How do you how do you say we want to have we're gonna have four arms and each of these arms is going to have a slightly different designed mm -hmm. robot. Yep. How do you get to that point, given that you don't have infinite funds and infinite yeah. subjects to test all those spots? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it is around, um, it can be a hypothesis based on, you know, there has been a gestalt sense that, you know, human behavior in this way leads to improved outcomes. But can you actually really show that? So some of it is just kind of yeah. getting down to the brass tacks of being able to actually go, it turns out explicitivity really makes a difference. I mean, and, and so... We intuit that when you talk about children's educational medium, that engaging children's emotion is really important. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the design of a lot of kind of technologies, this interpersonal emotional engagement is not necessarily something that's been designed for. So there's a lot of interesting science questions and human computer interaction questions around the role of affect and expressivity in human behavior that have not been kind of quantitatively shown yet. So a lot of it is to be able to say there is a sense or a hypothesis or, you know, suggestion, whatever, that this matters, we're going to actually quantify that mm. in a new way because we have these new set of tools. So some of the questions are around that. Let's, let's just get a little more precise and dotting the I's across the T's and running that study yeah. and showing that actually those behaviors actually move the needle. They do make a difference. I think so sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's looking at the landscape of kind of technologies. Like you now, um, you know, social robots are often getting compared to talking speakers. Does it matter that it's physically embodied? Let's do, let's show, let's actually do a longitudinal randomized controlled trial and actually look at the change and impact of human behavior if you have a socially expressive co-present other versus a obelisk that can talk. <laughs> now, right. my hypothesis is the social robot is going to get way more engagement, way more impact and benefit of human outcomes because we're social emotional creatures and this technology supports our human social emotional ways of experiencing and being way more than a talking speaker. And yet to be able to kind of propel the field forward and have people appreciate what is important and significant about this technology, we have to do the comparison. Because always sure. people think all that matters is just speech. Sure. And in fact, just <laughs> neutral speech. You don't even have to think about neutral factual speech. It's like, no, 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 no. There is so much more at play here yeah. and engaging human behavior and the impact of that on human behavior that it's like you have to like lift the veil and shine light on it to say, this stuff actually really, really matters. It's not just engagement and I like it and it's entertaining. It's like it actually really matters in the depth of human engagement and as a result, the depth of human outcomes you get. So and you just have to keep hammering that again and again Yeah, and yeah, again. yeah. I, 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 I take that as... <laughs> I mean, I, I, testing causal inference, never going to have a problem with that. But it, it, it strikes me as a really fundamental question in machine behavior, especially as it comes to human-machine interaction yep. and the behavioral ecology that's produced. How do we find where those machine design, this machine behaviors are optimal for the humans that they're mm -hmm. interacting with? I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the way we often begin is we, we want to anchor it in in just human behavior and psychology. And if we're talking so about kids and learning, it's an education. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we anchor it in kind of like, what, what's the lay of the land right now in terms of the studies that have been done and the insights and the hypotheses and the theories as they exist today? What are the, you know, for the case of social robots, there's a certain technology here with a certain set of kind of unique affordances. And when we're trying to choose, you know, what study, we're going to try to choose the ones that help us show in these kinds of domains, these kinds of applications, where those special attributes can really make a difference as well, mm -hmm. right? That's if you're trying to understand what the value proposition of this, this new technology called social robots. That's a different question than if you're looking broadly, expansively across any method, intervention, technology ever, right? Which could be augmented reality, virtual reality, I mean, sure, sure, I mean sure, sure. anything, right? Yeah. So 
So for us, it's, 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 it's a framing in terms of what's a special value add. It's, the, it's, it's framed in terms of how are you going to potentially be able to really so, you know, offer some compelling, effective solutions that don't already exist, right? So in the case of early childhood learning, so much science, so much economic shows that that's the critical time to intervene, mm -hmm. arguably the most critical time to intervene. A lot of kids don't go to preschool in this country. Way too many children don't start kindergarten ready to learn. There's not a whole lot of innovation happening mm -hmm. for that critical time to intervene. You need to be able to intervene arguably in the home, right? You need to be able to intervene in a way that parents and the siblings, it's got to fit into the home environment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you can do it in a way, so part of that kind of exploration space is also personalization. If part of what the system's also trying to do is on its own, so you kind of design your randomized controlled trial, but then the system itself is also gathering data and trying to adapt and personalize to maximize those objective functions as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's mm -hmm. a whole other kind of element of that. But part of that framing is if you could offer a personalized, affordable, scalable, effective educational intervention in the home, that would be game changing in so many ways. You know? So some of yeah. it is, how do I build the body of work and the systemization of applications and studies to show what that solution might look like, where the opportunity is, I would love to have a personal Mandarin tutor for my kids living with me, but I can't afford it. You know? But with a robot, yeah. Potentially I could, right? And then you could extend that to any kind of, you know, literacy, math, whatever, right? So so there's a there's a a huge kind of societal benefit, big challenge that we need to solve. Big, you know, improving the equity of education in this country is a huge thing we need to address. Yeah. Is there a unique way this technology can kind of tackle some of that? It's not gonna tackle all of it, tackle some of it. And and uniquely for a particular stakeholder group, young children. Or this can be particularly effective because children at that age learn through play, through much personal interaction. You don't want them putting their face in a screen. You want them heads up. You want mom to be able to be their siblings to be able to feel like it's a group interaction. You got to really deeply think about what is the learning experience you want for that child, and how do you craft that in a way that really makes sense for that child, right? So it's all of those factors, right? It's all of those factors. So that's a that's a fantastic description of kind of the design process and the science mm. that goes into testing whether or not these things work. Does this education robot actually improve educational mm. out outcomes? And in the design of that science, you have basically these, these different types of robots, these different types of robotic conditions mm -hmm. as the treatment variable mm -hmm. on uh, you know, the right-hand side of the equation for those who are methods-oriented. And then as the dependent variable, you have human outcomes. Mm. And what would it look like to actually switch the order of those two. Mm -hmm. If we're thinking about machine behavior as the dependent variable, mm -hmm. and then various different ways mm -hmm. that we can have humans either in a controlled way or in perhaps an uncontrolled way interact with mm -hmm. those machines and then measure the difference in how the machines pedagogical approaches differ based upon mm. the way that the kids are actually interacting mm -hmm. with that machine. What would that look like? And have you thought about doing any kind of studies like that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, so you could certainly ask the question of, so, so whether the machine is designed to be the same kind of machine with its personalization and learning algorithms, and you're putting the machine in front of different audiences, different social economic differences, different ages, I mean, whatever, whatever the different um, populations might be, to look and see what is the difference in the machine's personalization, strategies, whatever tax that it, that it uh, uh, develops over time from learning from interaction. Mm -hmm. How do those machines look different from one another is one way you could ask that question, right? Um, and I think, you know, when we look at, you know, moving from these shorter term interactions to these longitudinal interactions, we are definitely interested in, in, in looking at, like, how do you move from interaction to relationship and you know you can have kind of population effects of like a cohort of people, but you can also just look at what's the difference of these machines because of a longitudinal interaction with a particular individual. Mm -hmm. um, and as you vary potentially the algorithms under the hood, 
you could potentially do that over time, right? To see like if you run it for one month with this algorithm, another month with this algorithm, like do you see different kinds of uh, behaviors coming out of the machine mm -hmm. based on these algorithmic differences, right? Yeah, so there's a computational side where you can see what's the impact of the computational underlying mechanism of the hood given interaction with people. You could look at different cohorts of people and see how that might affect the behavior of the outcomes of the kinds of behaviors you see the machines mm -hmm. develop over mm -hmm. time through, again, various machine learning uh, methods. Um, you could look at short term and long term, mm -hmm. right? And that's another important dimension. You know, a lot of studies uh, often are looking at kind of shorter term encounters as opposed to what happens when you live with these things for weeks or months or years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? You know, I think that's also a really fascinating question to think about. And there are going to be different environments, you know, if it's somebody aging in place versus a family with young kids, you know, being able to think about how that affects the behavior of these systems over time. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, and how they, again, if you're applying reinforcement learning or other kind of machine learning algorithms, what are the policies, what are the behavior policies or the, the manners of uh, engaging, you know, again, developing these different behavioral policies? How are, how are those manifest across these different robots, depending on those kind of experiences that it's had over time? Yeah, I, I mean, if you, if you think about it in, in a case where you have uh, reinforcement, uh, reinforcement learning agents as these, these uh, robots and they're pedagogical agents, they're supposed to teach these students and as you were saying, you, you introduce these robots to different cohorts, uh, so let's say different socioeconomic uh, quartiles or something like that. Maybe. One of the really interesting things to me as a social scientist would be, okay, not, on, not only do those robots work differentially along those quartiles, again, mm. putting humans on, as a dependent variable, mm. but if those robots are trained in those settings, mm. like, can you take a robot that was trained in a lower uh, economic quartile and then is it as effective at getting another set of new, uh, you know, new, new kids to mm -hmm. learn as the robot that was originally trained perhaps over a longer time in the higher economic quartile? Mm -hmm. um, are these robots reflecting back things that they're learning from the data that they observe with the humans that they're interacting with? And, and kind of think about this in an iterated mm -hmm. process of understanding the nature of you know, humans teach machines and te uh, machines teach humans, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So it's just very interesting to think yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from looking at all those different uh, robot systems, you may be able to then holistically look back and see commonalities, mm -hmm. kind of the core principles that seem to hold across those different things. And then, But you'll also see where the differences are. And I think that's also illuminating, right? Which yeah. would be kind of like the additional aspects of support that may be needed to address the particular needs of that, of that group. Yeah. So whether it's to try to step back and kind of draw broader insights around, you know, any learning companion robot needs to have these properties, but if you're going to deal with the particular needs of this cohort, you need to have these other kind of attributes to be the most effective. I think, you know, there's different ways of looking at what are the insights being drawn from those, those, those explorations. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting stuff. So uh, one of the final questions, is that I had, and it's a bit off the wall, it's a bit futuristic, um, it's a bit speculative, but um, bear with me here. <laughs> so let's think about a future world where we do have highly personalized, highly customized social robots. And they are on net, you know, quite positive for us. They, they augment our social relationships for the most part. They help us learn to be better, and in all the ways that we've been talking about in terms of strengthening our ability to do things for ourselves, mm -hmm. they're basically just great assistive social robots. And on the whole, they are great for society and we like having them around. We interact with them regularly. So this is, I don't know, 2050, 2075, <laughs> 2020, um, who knows? But I'm somebody who's interested in causal inference and causal inference in social systems. and. Mm -hmm. There's a scenario where, okay, I have, I have a, my social robot and we talk at night and we talk a lot at night over the course of long periods of time and eventually the social robot says, you know, it actually looks like this relationship, the, the, the robot asked me a bunch of questions about the relationship that mm -hmm. I'm in. Um, and it, it says, well, after you know, asking you all these questions, it really seems like maybe you're not as happy as you should be. Is that true, Nick? 
And I say, huh, you know, after asking, asking all these questions, robot in 2075, you're right. And I'm going to change my life as a result. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go do something new with my life. I'm going to become a para jumper, et cetera, et cetera. And then something happens to me and I jump out of a plane and break my leg. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know what? I wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't for that social robot that that company sold me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm out of a job, injured, and it's all because of this social robot. How do we think about what that might look like in terms of the you know kind of current legal system that we have our societal institutions how we integrate these very radically different technologies into what it means to have causality in our mm. social systems can those robots be to blame can that can my social robot be to blame for my broken leg well i mean i you know this is getting into the legal side of things policies things like that i think you know Probably the starting point would be, you know, if this is a robot that you would be akin to, you know, a friend that you had that you were t having a beer with, you know, would you blame <clears throat> would you blame your friend for the fact that you broke your Maybe leg? Maybe. So, but anyway, so but then how is your friend legally accountable mm -hmm. for that, right? So I, I think, I mean, it's a it's something that I I don't have obviously a lot of deep expertise in thinking through the legal policy implications of it, but I feel like we probably are going to start with the nearest neighbor legal constructs and then evolve from there, right? I think it's going to be, like you said, decades and decades, maybe even you know centuries and centuries before we have these kinds of systems. We're going to have a lot of time to try to figure out along the way. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time sitting here and telling you what I think is going to be the right way to do things, sure, sure. other than I feel, again, as a fundamental principle, people need to be accountable for themselves and who they aspire to be, and these technologies is going to help support them in that. They should not be a crutch for people. So the way the system should be designed, it should be more to help you think about something versus telling you or, or making that judgment call. I mean, ultimately, that's your call to make or you should be certainly having those conversations with your family and friends and a whole host of other people. Um, so again, it's like this is one kind of hopefully useful, helpful, beneficial relationship in context of all the other useful, helpful, important, beneficial relationships that you have and you know that you're actually having it with a robot and because you've grown up in this future, you've actually you know, been exposed to AI since you were a kid and learning about it, so you've got some sense of the way these things think and you know, you're gonna be able to put that in context you know, to be able to think about how, how much credence, how much uh, am I gonna weigh in you know, into this conversation I have with my, my robot who does know me and is trying to you know, help me through this decision, yeah. but ultimately, you got to be accountable. Sure. You know, you're 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 the the human being there. So the buck stops here. The buck's got to stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Sorry to well, stop with people. Don't with that, uh, I think we're pretty much out of time. Thank you very much for <laughs> the you. chat. It was very wide ranging and very stimulating <laughs> to me. So, thank <laughs> Great. You. Thank you.